Okay, Luke 13, verse 10. You hear God's word. God's holy word. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, who was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. When Jesus saw her, he called her to himself and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered and said to him, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan is bound, think of it, for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Amen. Well, uh, we can get quite uh, fed up. Fed up with ourselves. Uh, fed up with others. Fed up with the world. Fed up with the sin that we struggle amongst and we struggle with. Fed up with our circumstances and in all of this, we need to remember that God does not change. God remains to us a resting place. And that is the whole point of the Sabbath. You see it very clearly at the very beginning. Uh, God creates the world six days. He makes it beautiful and orderly and fantastic and perfect. And then he gives this day when man might pause and rest in the perfect God who stands behind it all. God is saying, man, seek your rest in me. And here in this Sabbath passage, God reminds us of that. He lifts the curtain of the Sabbath day and he reveals himself in the flesh of his son. God breaks into our world and he says, for all of your trouble and restlessness, for all that plagues you, I want you to know this, that I am your rest. I am your rest. The Lord God our rest. This is Christ. Think about this in three ways. Firstly, this, there is no more no more pretending with Christ. No more pretending. Uh, you don't have to make out as though everything is hunky-dory when it's not. You don't have to do this anymore. On the lighter end of things, we hide um, our weaknesses and struggles from others. Uh, struggles of body, struggles of mind. Um, and we do it because we don't want to appear weak. Uh, we don't want to be a, a pity case. Uh, we don't want to risk relationships, uh, giving people the impression that we are going to be a greater burden uh, to them uh, than we can offer them things uh, to gain from us. We, we hide these things from others because we don't want to jeopardise opportunities. We, uh, we don't want employers to think that we might be a risk factor to them. And so we have this tendency to hide, to hide our weaknesses. We don't want other people to see our vulnerabilities. But here's the beautiful thing with Jesus. You don't have to do that. You can't do that. You don't have to hide anything from the Lord. As God reveals himself in Genesis 16 and verse 13, as the God who sees the servant Hagar, who's fled from her mistress, pregnant, harmed, and hurting, and she says, I see the one who sees me. I want you to see how beautiful it is here in verse 12. The Lord is there in the synagogue and he is preaching to this packed out crowd and there are enemies there and there's all kinds of dangers that he has to dodge. There's, there's the thinking ahead in his sermon. There's the wise selection of words and phrases and all of the rest. But what does he do in verse 12? He sees. He sees this woman who has been plagued with an infirmity for 18 years. He doesn't just see her crippled. He sees her 18 years years of travail and suffering and pain, but he sees it all. It's not hidden from the Lord, and he loves this woman. Uh, I think about it um, later on in Luke's Gospel with um, one of my favourite characters, uh, little Zacchaeus, and Jesus comes to town, and the crowd are there, and he desperately wants to see Jesus. 
And so what does he do? He climbs up the tree. But one of the things you'll see, and if you look and read through the beginning of Luke 19 later on, you'll see if he is seeking to see Jesus, what happens? Jesus sees him. Jesus sees him. Jesus sees this woman. 18 years of infirmity. Jesus sees you. Every weakness, every vulnerability, he sees it all. That's on the lighter end of things. On the heavier end, I want you to know this, he sees your sin. But he also sees your deceit. We are plagued with sin, and yet we convince others we're not, and we convince ourselves we're not. Um, sometimes we do that willfully, and sometimes we do it unthinkingly. Our hearts are just prone to deceit. I tell you now, you are sinful, all of you, and you are deceitful. You don't know how bad you are. Um, this is a fairly innocuous example, but um, I'll share it anyway. Just last week, um, I had an appointment, and um, I was sharing with a clinician. They were asking me about sleep patterns, and um, they asked me, when do you wake up? And I said, I said to them, um, well, you know, it changes from day to day, but, you know, any time, you know, between seven and eight, but, you know, I'm a really bad sleeper. I never sleep past eight o'clock. And then this very week, I slept till half past eight. It does happen sometimes. And that seems like a kind of foolish and silly thing. I never sleep past nine o'clock, by the way. I do sleep till half past eight sometimes. But why is it? Why is it that I unthinkingly said to the clinician, I never sleep past eight, when actually sometimes I do sleep till 8.30? Why? Because I like to think of myself as better than I am. That's why. There is something in me that would condemn and judge a person who sleeps beyond eight o'clock. And so I've convinced, not just others, but I've convinced myself I'm not the kind of person who ever sleeps till half past eight. I'm not the kind of person who ever loses a morning. That is exactly the kind of person I am. We do that all the time, and Jesus sees it. Here's this compassionate miracle, and the ruler's response is what in verse 14? He is indignant. He is indignant, why? Because he believes that he is better than Jesus. He believes that he has a greater, a more accurate interpretation of the law of God. Uh, he believes that he walks closer to the Lord than Jesus does. And he calls out in this great act of public confrontation with the Son of God. There are six days in which men ought to work. Therefore come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. And on the face of it, it sounds very righteous. He is safeguarding the Sabbath. He is safeguarding the holy law of God. And he's saying there are, there are all of these other days on which we can do these other deeds of, of mercy. And he's saying this in front of everybody. And he makes Jesus look like a covenant breaker. And you understand that the penalty for breaking the Sabbath day is, that, is death in the old covenant. He is finding something with which Jesus might be charged to put to death with. And he believes it. The ruler of the synagogue believes that he has a greater interpretation of the law than Jesus. That he has a greater practice of the law than Jesus. And what does Jesus do? It's astonishing. In an instant and a heartbeat, he exposes this man who is left without any answer before him. The man believes he is interpreting God's law faithfully. He is in interpreting God's law with integrity. And then Jesus says, wait a minute. What do you do on the Sabbath? Is it not the case that you loose your ox and your donkey, you unbind them, and you take them for a drink? Do you not do it? They all do it. And then he turns to them. He says, you hypocrite. Hypocrite. This woman, this daughter of Eve, no, not just a daughter of Eve, but a daughter of Abraham, has been bound by Satan for 18 years. You know it. And you object to her being set free on the Sabbath day, but you would give your donkey a drink. What is Jesus saying to this man? He's saying that this man, far from interpreting God's law accurately, far from walking closely with God, has opposed God at the very core of creation. God creates animal, then he creates man. This man has prized animal over a daughter of Abraham, over a daughter of the covenant. He has no defense, and those who agreed with him. And they are left in that moment before the crowd, completely shamed and exposed before God. He thought he was better than he was. He is worse 
than he could ever imagine. This is the nature of man. We think ourselves better than we are. We are worse than we would ever imagine ourselves to be. We really are. And why? Because, well, again, we want to protect ourselves. If people see our sins, well, they'll use them to leverage advantage over us and to disadvantage us. We also do it because it's too painful. If you've ever actually been confronted with like real meaningful sin in your life, it is the most painful experience because you are brought face to face with the reality that you are an unrighteous, unloving, selfish, impure, unholy, ungodly sinner. And you know you are deserving of nothing but death. But what does the Lord see? He sees this woman in her infirmity and he sees straight through the leader of the synagogue. The Lord sees us. And there is a kind of belief in that, whether that is a happy thought or whether it is a terrifying thought, to know this, that you are naked before God. There is absolutely nothing. You might hide it from yourself. You might hide it from others. But there is nothing that is hidden from him. But it is a liberating thing. We go all of our lives pretending we're something we're not. But Jesus is saying, you don't have to pretend with me. I see it all. I see exactly what you are. There is no struggle. There's no use trying to rationalize your sin, find justifications. I see everything that you are. Now, he doesn't just lead us there. He says, you don't need to pretend anymore before me. Then he leads us on and he reveals himself as a resting place. What do we do with everything that we hide with our embarrassment and our shame? Jesus says, I want you to come and rest in me. This is the theme of the Sabbath, as I said. The very first Sabbath was a sweet day of reflection and delighting in the God who had made all things good. Adam and Eve could look out at the garden, the flowing streams of water, the flowers, the plants, the, the animals they'd see in the entire variety before them. And then God says, now look up and see supreme goodness, supreme creativity, to supreme <coughs> love. I want you to pause and rest in me. Every other Sabbath is about this. Every other Sabbath is a little different. Every other Sabbath is conducted in the context of a fallen world, in the context of pain and suffering and sin and death, and yet still God's people would gather, God's people would worship. Why? Well, they would do so in hopeful adoration of the unchanging God. That God had not changed, the world had changed, but God had not changed. And they would gather in that hopeful adoration of the unchanging God who had promised to set things right. So that though they came with broken hearts and with broken souls, they would hear on that Sabbath day, I am still your God. As they came to make covenant again, God would declare to them, I've not abandoned you. I am still your God. You are still my people. As the sacrifices were offered up, God would say to the people, I will put away your sin. As the people were commanded to give up their ordinary work and labor, Jesus, uh, God was saying to the people on the Sabbath day, I will lift and lighten your burdens. And then as we see the Sabbath principle carried on in the year of Jubilee as the land was returned to the original owners, as debts were cancelled, as Hebrew slaves were set free. God is saying through the Sabbath, I will release your debts. I will set you free. What I'm going to do is I'm going to restore everything that has been lost through sin, everything that has been lost in this fallen world. I'm going to set it right. That's what the Sabbath is all about. The unchanging God who has come to set things Right, and still here on this Sabbath day, in our text, and on our Sabbath day, we still feel the strains of a fallen world. But see it in the text. This daughter of Abraham, though she has come out each Sabbath day, awaiting her liberty and awaiting her freedom, is still bound by Satan. She's not demon-possessed. What we learn here is that Satan has power to afflict God's people, even with sicknesses and illness, and she has been bound by him for 18 years. 
But what is the consequence of it? She is arched and she is bound over, meaning she cannot lift herself up straight. She cannot look up to heaven as Solomon does in his posture of praise and worship, bound by Satan. And at the same time, you see corrupted leaders, the very people who are there to proclaim liberty to this woman, proclaim liberty to the children of Israel, are, 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 are corrupting the law of God, are, are getting in the way of the people drawing nearer to God. They are leading to a further bondage of the people of Israel. And in all of this, they still have to deal with all of the travails of ordinary life, of their own sin, of their own guilt, of that inner conflict. They're tired and they're tormented. And in many ways, I think the woman is a symbol of Israel. The woman is bent over like a beast looking to the ground. And this is the state of the leader's soul. This is the state of Israel. The woman is bound by Satan as this nation is held by the shackles of the evil one, having not entered into the full freedom of the children of God, not knowing the full truth of God. But then what do we see in this passage? What is Jesus showing to the leaders, showing to us? He's showing this, that everything that was promised in the Sabbath finds its reality in Jesus. As the jubilee trumpet would sound on that 50th year, so Jesus calls out to the woman in verse 12, Woman! He calls to her, he announces like a trumpet blast, woman, your infirmities are loose. And in that moment, he goes and he touches her and he lifts her up into the worshipful rest of God. Jesus comes and he lifts the veil of the Sabbath day. And he says, I am the rest that you have been waiting for. I can heal your body. I can heal your soul. And I can lift you up again into that blessed and restful presence that comes from being a worshipper in communion and life and fellowship with the God of Israel. And in this he is proclaiming to sinners, to the hypocrites, to those hindered in their walk with God, deceived by their own sin. I am rest. I see everything that you are, but I can give you rest. I can straighten out your body. I can straighten out your soul. I can raise you again into the worshipful presence of God. It's more than hinted here in the mention of the six days in verse 14, and the six days of the fourth commandment, which are grounded in the creation. For in six days the Lord God made the heavens and the earth that here, the thing that is broken in creation, mankind, the created order itself, is being set right by Christ. He's saying on this Sabbath day is the beginning of the freeing and the liberty, not just of man, but of all creation. This is the beginning of a saved and a redeemed creation. I'm going to make all things right Again, on this broken Sabbath, in which the people wait in hope for all to be fixed and healed and made right, Jesus stands in the midst of the synagogue, and he heals this woman, and he raises her again into the presence of God, and he declares, I have come to set all things right. So what do we do with all that we want to hide, our embarrassment, our shame, our sin, our weariness. We stop pretending. He sees it all. We seek this rest that he offers to us in himself. We rest in Jesus. No more pretending, he says, rest in me. But then you say, but how? How can I know this rest that you offer? that I need. Uh, and he says this finally, come, come under my authority, come under my authority. Now, and first I just deal with an objection. The objection is this, that nothing um, has really changed. You know, uh, we preach these sermons often about Christ coming as the fulfillment of promise, Christ coming as the rest anticipated in the Sabbath and Christ bringing the new creation and still we feel as broken as that crooked woman on the Sabbath day. Uh, at least in part we do, I think we have other comforts and consolations, but um, sometimes we ask, well, what has changed? It seems nothing has changed. And there are two answers to that. 
and they lead us into this idea of authority. But the first is, um, just remember that the pattern of creation is that it moves from uh, darkness to ordered goodness. And um, through the fall, it is descended into disorder and darkness again. And you see that um, pattern in the plagues of Egypt. And as we're going through as a family, uh, the plagues, they affect the water, they affect the ground, they affect the animals, they affect man. But then the penultimate plague is thick, impenetrable darkness. God is saying through the pride of Pharaoh, through the sin of man, they have brought themselves to a state of de-creation, of uncreated disorder, and it goes hand in hand with the death that follows. There is thick and impenetrable darkness, and we see it in our world. We see it in men who have become bent over like beasts, who do not stand upright and righteous in the assemblies and pray, in the assemblies of God and in the praise of his holy name. The world is filled with darkness. Well, the new world comes and it works from that place of darkness and disorder and it works out to order and to light and finally to ultimate and perfect rest. And this is what Jesus has done from the darkness and death of the tomb. He has gone out as light in the world and he has filled minds and hearts of men and women. He has changed men and women. He has changed nations. He has established truth on the earth. That light is going forth. And in time, it will consume, it will cover, it will perfect the earth. And so, in one sense, the answer is we wait. We patiently wait upon the Lord until he's finished his conquest. But the second answer to the question, well, nothing has changed, is this, that there is a relief um, for us while we wait, um, and a greater relief the more we are willing to come under his authority. And so this is what the passage, um, in many ways, is all about. Uh, the woman here comes under the authority of Christ. He issues the call and the command, woman, your infirmity is loose. And as she comes under the hand of Jesus, as he sets his hands upon her, she's immediately straightened. Her body and her soul is set right before God. Here's what he's saying. Like, I brought this rest of the Sabbath day, but it's found as you come under my yoke. And so the woman is brought under the yoke of Christ. But then you see it also in the leaders. So the problem for the leaders is their thinking is wrong and their heart is wrong. Their interpretation of the law is wrong and they're callous. But what is Jesus in this passage? Jesus is uh, the truth. Uh, Jesus uh, shows the, the fullness of Sabbath, that it was um, that it was not made for man, but man, uh, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. Christ comes and he shows the, the mercy, the love, the healing power of God on this Sabbath day. He he has the right interpretation of the law and he shows them the love and the compassion of God, that thing that they lack within their hearts. So their thinking is crooked, their hearts are crooked, but Jesus is upright and Jesus is straight. And as the woman comes under his authority and is healed, Jesus is saying to the leaders, look, come under my authority and I will straighten out your thinking and I will heal your hearts. It's another way of saying that we are to come under his authority. If we're outside of the authority, we're crooked, we're corrupted, all is going wrong, misery comes into our life. If we come under his authority, we're straightened out, we're healed, we're restored, we enter into his peace and rest. Now, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying that if you humble yourself under the authority of Christ, that everything's going to be perfect. I'm not saying that all of your problems will go away, but I am saying this, that if you humble yourself under the authority of Christ, you will save yourself so much grief. All of that grief that comes from being conflicted, from wanting to tell ourselves that we are better than we are when we know full well we are worse than we ever imagined ourselves, from pretending and getting tired of pretending and never wanting to really look in the mirror and see what we really are. The shame and, and the guilt that comes with that, the restlessness and the way in which it hinders our life with, with God. All of these things are, are griefs that come from not being under the authority of Christ. And it's not like it's one or the other. 
It's not like either you're not under his authority or you are under his authority. In one sense, that is true. But also, if you come under the authority of Christ, it is an entire spectrum of obedience. It's like a kid within a household. A kid within a household can either have absolute loving, happy submission to their parents and so have harmony and peace and joy and blessing in that. Or a kid can be at war with their parents. They can be in kind of partial submission, but also be like kind of warring and holding back from their parents and so uh, quenching their joy and their peace in all of that. And this is how it is. There is an entire spectrum of obedience before God. And so how do we come under this authority of Christ? How do we come under it that we would receive the, the rest that he promises to us? And I can tell you this, it's not. It is not you and your Bible. As much as the church has drifted in this direction, it is not you and your Bible. Ironically, you and your Bible lead simply to you and your own autonomy. It leads to you being a law unto yourself, which is ironically contrary to the word of God. How do we come under this authority of Christ? Luke develops it through the book of Acts. There is but one authority that he has established on earth, and it is Christ himself in his church through the word of God, through the sacraments, and through the minister's of his church. It's not you in your Bible, it is you in his church. And the more meaningfully, the more humbly you share in the life of the body, the greater you know the assurances that come and flow from his promises. The greater joy you have in his presence, the greater security in the strength of his people. We can keep ourselves at a distance, and our thinking will continue to be disordered. But the closer we come, the more we give ourselves, the more our mind is straightened out, the more our hearts are filled with love, the greater the Sabbath rest of Christ is known within our lives. Our Sabbath has come, and he opens himself to us as a resting place. We're conflicted, we're disordered, we're times filled with shame and disgust, but he sees it. I see all that you are, you don't have to pretend before me. The veil is lifted, I am the Sabbath you seek. I will give rest for your souls, I will pardon your sins, I'll give you the wisdom and counsel of God. I'll give you my spirit as a guide for this life. I'll give you a hope for the future. But my rest is found increasingly as you come like that woman under the hands of Christ, under my authority. And my authority is exercised in but one place. Me, through my church, in word and sacrament, and the ministry. Come closer to the community of the church. Humble yourself and know the increased peace that flows from the rest that Christ has brought to this world. Know that you will be kept for the rest that is coming.